Everybody, welcome uh, to my talk today for Philly Tech Week. Uh, it's called Accelerating React Applications with Server-Side React Frameworks. We're going to take a look at Next.js, Remix Run, and we'll talk a little bit about React 18 uh, server render components, just a little bit. Um, my name is Ken Rimple. I work for Chariot Solutions, uh, and I focus on front-end applications with JavaScript. Uh, I also am a, a back-end engineer uh, with uh, experience in Node and a lot of Spring in Java, um, Groovy, all sorts of other things, and uh, databases and everything else. So I've been around a long time, seen a lot of different types of platforms. Um, and so this is kind of a survey I did because uh, in the last year or two, specifically the last year, uh, React has been the most popular front-end framework for all of our clients pretty much. There's some that haven't used it, but there's still the majority of our clients doing front-end are looking at React or using React. And with that comes some potential challenges uh, in terms of performance. So um, this talk tries to address that by looking at some of the frameworks that have come about on top of React, specifically Next.js and Remix Run. Um, so let's see. Um, if you are going to get the most out of this talk, I'm assuming you have some background in the following. And if not, you can watch it later after reading up on these things. So first of all, understanding of functional React and hooks will help you. Um, you can follow along and understand the concepts, but I show a little code, you might get confused if you're not used to functional React. Basically, React switched over about two years ago to using something called hooks, which are functions instead of classes. So that's really important to know how to do to really take advantage of these frameworks because they both uh, use functional React. Understanding promises. I mean, if you've done anything in JavaScript that does anything with a, a network connection, uh, you're using promises already with a then method. The current pattern of that is async and await. Uh, you'll see a lot of that when we start talking about code, but that's really important to know because that's how you do asynchronous JavaScript. Also, experience using React against client-side APIs. So if you've ever used Fetch or Axios and loaded data into a React uh, component, uh, this is the talk for you, especially if you have larger applications. Um, so for example, vanilla React starts getting difficult to deal with, plain old React, if you have a couple of different things, including large amounts of data. So the first one would be static or close to static content. Um, but you also need React activity. So let's say you have a large content-driven data source. You want to put a, a catalog online or some sort of document database online. You want to be able to search it, and you want to be able to fill out forms for information. You want to be very interactive with the uh, front end. Um, but you've got a lot of static content. So that is something that React itself doesn't deal with very well. There are tools uh, called the Jamstack. It's concept of JavaScript and HTML. Uh, JavaScript and markup, uh, but the concept is that you can server render things or server generate things specifically with that. So you've heard of tools such as Gatsby. Uh, Gatsby is a React-based framework that statically generates content for you. The one I'm talking about today that does that is Next.js. So we'll talk about that static content or close to static content that you want to pre-generate to speed up uh, loading it because you're loading it over and over again and you want to take the time to generate it again each time. If you have an existing app and that existing app is really sluggish, um, you know, maybe you're loading a lot of data when you log in. Maybe the application takes a lot of data in, but only shows a small chunk of it. So you're loading a lot of data and you're throwing most of it into memory and that takes time. Or maybe you've got a lot of pages uh, in your routes and it just takes a while to load up. Um, you know, any kind of initialization complexity, a giant monolith in React, and I've seen these. Um, certainly vanilla React by itself, you need to kind of go out of it uh, and use other alternative technologies to speed it up. And both of these frameworks do that. Uh, if you have clients with slow networks, uh, so for example, you know, you, you have a, a, an application that goes to a lot of different data sources, but when you connect to it from a client, it's a slow client or in a very slow network. And now all the latency of that client is magnified by all the hits that you take to go to all the other auxiliary sources to get your data. Um, or high latency, it takes a while to get the answer back. Google has a statistic that uh, says the probability of bounce, meaning leaving a site once you visit it, increases 32% as the page load time goes from one second to three seconds. Now, it turns out there's a lot of these different metrics out there. Uh, Google has uh, a whole 
performance management team. Um, and so if you take a look at Google's performance team, they talk a lot about these things. They've done tons of metrics, especially on mobile, where you can make an app look like a mobile application. So you, you know, hit it with your browser and it looks nice, but it's slow because you haven't optimized the way that it loads. People will leave your site if it's a public site. If you're putting a, 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 a content management system online where you want to show catalogs of content and it takes seven seconds to load your page, people aren't going to stick with you. You'll, you'll lose some customers. So it's important to suss these things out and find ways to speed them up. So these are the two platforms we'll talk about today, Next.js and Remix Run. And they are platforms on top of React. So let's start looking at Next.js first. Oh, by the way, if you have questions, put them in chat. I will check them towards the end of the presentation and answer them. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna go through the talk and then address the questions towards the end. All right, so what is Next.js? So it's a React-driven framework, as I said before, and a focus on performance. Um, some of the major features is something called server-side rendering. So if you imagine your React application downloading the entire React application to the browser, it's starting up and then it doing its work, server-side rendering is doing all of the data fetching and such on the server and shipping you content when you start the application. So it's a at request time going and getting data and bringing back the data with the component. Both of these frameworks do this. Static site generation is Next.js's uh, uh, feature. Again, it kind of comes from the Gatsby world and Jamstack, uh, pre-rendering static content. So when you build, so this is a build time, it will go and fetch the content for you static pages to load to start off your application. So that is something that Next.js does to help you optimize performance. In addition to that, there's a feature called incremental static regeneration that's part of Next.js as well that we'll talk about. That lets you update the generated data once it becomes stale. Or maybe you've got a huge amount of data and you only want to bring back a couple of them pre-rendered on the server at build time and the rest you want to render using server-side rendering. Well, that's something you can do as well with Next.js. And also, uh, there are client-side uh, libraries. We've all used things like Axios and Fetch. SWR is a Next.js library for client caching. And so what you'll notice is the Next.js team took a very React-driven way of optimizing React applications and built a bunch of components and features around React. Remix does it a little differently. Um, so you'll see a lot of features that are baked into Next.js as components and APIs. And you'll see that the way they do it in Remix is a little more straightforward and simpler, uh, less engineering based and more kind of content based. The next router uh, is part of uh, Next.js as well. Uh, and so Next.js has this router. Uh, it is basically a file based router which means that you create a directory called routes and you put all of your components that you wanna to route to in this routes directory and they become your routing API. So you can show different pages in the application and you can launch them to start the application up and it will load them quickly and then asynchronously load the rest of the page. So again, Remix Run just has a server side rendering of this, but Next.js has all of these features. It's been around a long time. Uh, I forget the year, but uh, we've actually had uh, a speaker at ETE in 2017, who is one of the founders of uh, Next.js, speaking about Next.js even back then. So the current version of Next is a version uh, point release of version 12, where they in, uh, improve the speed of uh, incremental static, re static regeneration. Uh, they've added some faster builds. Um, they introduced the static regeneration, I believe, uh, in Next.js 8 and then improved it in 9. So it's been around a long time. Uh, and you can take a look at the way they upgrade uh, if you want to. I left a link there for you. Now let's look at Remix. So Remix, their philosophy is try to use web standards as much as possible. So server-side rendering, yep. Now the, the interesting thing about this is the, the fetch API that they give you in Remix is the actual web fetch API from a browser. 
So if you know how to do fetch from the React client, the fetch you use in the browser is the same fetch you use and the same request response and so on that you use from the browser in Remix's server-side code. They are also a file-based router. Their file-based router is a little more sophisticated than Next.js, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. They support something called progressive enhancement. So this is actually a concept that you might have run into when you were doing things like jQuery back in the server-side days, where you wanted to be able to run a site and make it operate mostly with just server code and disable the JavaScript. So I personally have not used this yet, but you can turn off JavaScript and things like forms and the server rendering and server generation will still work just as they are. Um, you just can't run real React components. But uh, if you have a site that you want to use Remix on and in a couple of places, uh, you want a public part of the site where you've got a regular form, you can just build a standard HTML form and you can build a server side um, handler and action for it and it will post to it automatically and treat it like a regular web server. Turn back on JavaScript and it functions like a regular React application. So that's an interesting thing that they've done. All right. So they have a philosophy I wanted to bring up because they are the newcomer and also they're trying to change the way that people think about um, client and server together. Um, so their philosophy starts with embracing the server and client model. So the idea is that you have the source code and you have the content separated from each other, uh, including the protocols they use and the things they do. Um, you know, you're basically using standard HTTP back and forth. Work with, not against the foundation of the web. So browsers, HTTP and HTML, it's all been good. Um, use JavaScript to augment the user experience, hence being able to kind of turn off JavaScript for forms and things like that. And emulate the browser behavior in the APIs where possible. And their goal is to not over abstract the underlying technologies. My assumption there, uh, why they made that, was they were probably looking at things like Next.js and seeing where they were headed with lots of very specific one off APIs that were their own abstractions around things like writing headers um, and uh, handling images and such. So that's their philosophy. Let's take a look at client fetching. So the first thing is if we go into a browser, and I have some demos here. Um, this is a little throwaway application that I did that uh, renders a bunch of podcasts. Um, I pulled down from my, uh, my podcast feed catcher, uh, turned it into an XML file, parsed it through it into a database in two tables, a, a shows table basically and a episodes table. And so what I have here is I have React itself loading this page and the page has card components and each of the card components has a button and an image and the description. So if I refresh this and load this up, let's take a look at all the requests that happen on load. Right, that's a lot that got loaded. Um, but if you see what happens when we load a React application, we'll kind of go through it. We get the, the initial page. After the initial page, it gives us the JavaScript bundle to bootstrap React. Then um, I've turned on React DevTools in my browser, so that's showing that. You can ignore that. That's the plugin. So now, once we bootstrap, the next thing it has to do, it has to go basically fetch stuff. Um, so for example, it's got to go get the content that it needs. And then it gets the data. So now we're doing a fetch. So this is where we actually do our kind of loading phase. It's loading our feed data. Don't know why it's loading it twice. Uh, it's loading our JavaScript for the application itself, um, which probably happens first. Obviously, it's probably the very first thing that happens. Uh, let me do this. Yeah, there. Okay. Well, anyway. So it loads that first, bootstraps the application. Now, what is all this stuff? Well, this stuff is all of the images for all the podcasts. But everything loads after the app boots. So the point being, app boots up in this phase here. So that's about 150 milliseconds. Uh, for the bootstrap and then another 100 milliseconds, <clears throat> maybe a little less, to load React itself and the first scripts. Now I've got a throwaway application. Let's say you've got a giant monolith. That could take a lot of time. That could take a second or two, depending on how much you have in there. So the bottom line is that's going to take a while. And once it bootstraps, then it starts the Ajax requests, the network requests. And then after the network requests settle down, anything else that they loaded that needs to be loaded, like an image, 
gets loaded next. So that's your typical React loading profile. So you get the entire React application through those steps. It downloads everything, boots the application. Now it does a get. Let's say you've got like your web server in Virginia and a cloud network server for one thing in Virginia and another one in Ohio, and you're doing two fetches. So one's got to do the, the fetch. And in React functional components, we usually do that from use effect. If you're in a uh, you know, class-based component, it's component did mount. That goes, maybe you do them both in parallel. Hopefully you do if you can. So you've kicked off two promises and you're waiting for them both to complete. This one comes back, that one comes back. And now you're able to do something with that data. A couple of things that also you want to be aware of is um, there is a certain amount of time that it takes to make the app interactive. So when React itself boots and it can kick off promises and the promises are in flight, you should be able to do things in the React application. So basically it's like the time to interactive metric. And there's also other metrics, for example, the, the most uh, significant uh, payload that comes back that they check with metrics. The longer it takes to get all these things back, the less likely your user is to stay with you. All right, so if it takes a long time to load the app because it's a monolith and it takes a while to load everything, that's one issue. If it takes a long time to get the data back because maybe you're not paging it or whatever, um, or maybe you are paging it, but you have a giant chunk you're bringing back and not limiting the paging on the server side, well, then it's gonna take a while for it to bring the chunk of data back that you care about, and that could take time too. All these are things that could basically delay you and have your people leave your uh, application. Let's look at server-side rendering. All right, so whether we're talking about Next.js or Remix, and we'll look at both, um, it's the same, let's take the same topology, we're gonna have a server in one place, uh, and it's one RESTful service to get data from in the same place, co-located, and another one remotely. So with a server-side rendering, we get the page. During server-side rendering, it goes ahead and it fetches the data for you on the server. I should mention both of these technologies are Node.js based servers. Um, and they can live in Docker containers, they can live on edge services like Cloudflare or Vercel. Um, they can live in different places. So these things can run in a data center and get the data back. So we fetch our data, just fetch our other data because we hope they're doing this in parallel. We get our data back, get the second piece of data back. And then when the data comes back, it will assemble, assemble the data and bring back the data for the page. And bootstrap react okay so the data gets assembled sent back um, and it will bootstrap react with that data so that it doesn't have to wait on the client side to fetch that data the theory being servers can fetch things faster than clients so let me put a little question mark out there for you to think about um, how long does it take to get your data from another source if for whatever reason your data is let's say in ohio in a slower data source um, and you've built your application in such a way that you server render both from the same component. And that component waits for both to send the data back because that's how server rendering works. You could have as much latency, but it's shifted to the server. Or let's say that your server is really constrained and slow because it's running too much. Uh, maybe you didn't size it right, right? Maybe you're running a single Docker instance of a node server and it's consumed with like 10 requests and it can't give you yours because the current request is being service sending data back. So what I'm saying is server rendering is a great idea. It's a great concept technology wise. It can be fast, but you've shifted a little bit of your technology and your sophistication to the server side. So you need to really think about how you architect your services and monitor those services. So both of these tools can do this. Um, the main thing is if you've got, let's say, a latency uh, troubled server in Ohio, it could slow down things where you're waiting for that for the server rendering to happen. Still, it could have done it on the client side. On the client side, however, you know, you would be having to set up some sort of suspense in React 18 or, you know, doing something about loading a spinner for that. The bottom line is that, you know, you can use server side rendering. It can make things more smooth for the client and especially for clients that have issues with speed, um, but just pay attention to the servers you're putting it on. If we decide to use edge computing, where we're, let's say, in Cloudflare or Vercel, or we're running an AWS uh, and we have Docker containers in the same data center, 
um, or a fast link to them from, from you know, some sort of uh, CloudFront service. Well, then we can certainly get the page, the web server that runs Node can get the calls done. They're co-located or close to each other. By the way, I want you to think about this. Why do you have to use fetch? All right, you could use a database call. So if, for example, you're using Postgres um, or a NoSQL database for that matter, why can't the node server do Postgres calls? It certainly can. That may be faster than doing a fetch. So these are the types of things you can start doing when you're using server-side rendering as opposed to client-side fetching. Because in client-side fetching, you have to bring back a RESTful response, or you know, if you're using something else like a GraphQL, you still have to bring back some sort of serialized response. If you're doing your calls from your server, from your server-side component directly to the database, nice and quick. So you could say get for this example, or even do you know, a database fetch here. Bring the JSON payloads back quickly because they're co-located and close to you and assemble the data and deliver the rendered page content. All right, so let's look at server-side rendering then. All right, so this example here, we are using, um, sorry, I'm gonna use this one. That's server-side rendering, yes, okay. So server-side rendering, and I'm gonna load this thing again. What we're doing, same set of components that we saw on the React client, but I've written them using Next.js. And when I wrote them using Next.js, um, I've decided to implement them using uh, an image tag too. But you know what, I'm gonna turn, yeah, I'm gonna turn that off first. Yes. All right, so let's do this. So I'm gonna reload and we're gonna look at this load and see what it does. Well, now that's interesting because you know from looking at the other one that there was a bunch of work up front. And that bunch of work up front uh, took some time. Let me just drag this to the left. See that? That's that bootstrapping, right? We start the bootstrap, we load React, and then we load our feeds. Now we're like 250 milliseconds in the throwaway app, you know, right about here. We go back over to our server side rendered React. Uh, that's nice and fast. That's like 50 milliseconds or so, I think. Um, really good. So take a look at what it returns when we load this. Let's, let's take a look at the actual content. Look at that. It's the actual content with the data pre-rendered, server side rendering. And at the very end of it, I hope I can show you this. At the very end of it, it basically says, start loading your code. I can't really show you this because it's kind of minified, but it starts loading the code and it starts bringing back data for you. And now what's this other junk in here? Well, this is all your images. And it also then does another fetch. I think headers. No, no, it doesn't. I'm looking at this page. Here we go. Yeah, so it loads the react application in the background so that's part of what was being sent down in this initial request was the react application uh the the links to the scripts for that so they get loaded early on there it goes but don't forget the content is already loaded at this point right the content is in there and then it will load up everything else now all the images show up so that's server-side rendering uh, same thing in Remix, do the same load, same application. Right now it's a little bit uh, shorter timeline for everything uh, and it showed me 50 milliseconds or so to load it. Same deal here, there's our content. That's our page. And then it boots everything after that. You'll see we uh, our CSS, our styles, Somewhere in here is the JavaScript. There it is, actions, helpers. So there's our JavaScript as well. All right, so both of these have an advantage, especially in larger applications for a couple of reasons. Number one, the, the page you go to is the page that it serves immediately. So for example, if I pick a podcast and remix, see how quick that was? I mean, of course it's a toy app, but almost instantaneous if I clear this, Boom, right? Nice and quick, 40 milliseconds. It gets to the route. 
Now notice we are routing, so this should not reload. If I highlight this page content, it should not unclick itself. See, we're still in the server. Um, sorry, we're still in the React app once it boots. So we only take the React app boot uh, on the first hit. Also, if I go to the detail page and I hit that particular one, well, I do the server-side rendering for that one, and so it loads that page's content, right? So if I look at this there, what it loaded this time was it loaded the 60 Cycle Hum podcast, which is a guitar podcast. Uh, it loaded that thing up for me, and it didn't load the whole app first. So that shows up immediately, and React loads in the background asynchronously. So that's one of the benefits of these things with, with the router is when you route, you immediately go to the page you want with the content you want with single server-side rendering, and then it background loads the rest of React while you're looking and consuming that content. So your time to load is quick, your time to interactive is quick, um, you know, all good stuff for keeping people on your site, whether you use Next.js or Remix. So let's look at how this is done. Uh, in Next.js, the way Next.js works is let's assume this, this piece of code down below here, this export default function podcasts is the component, the podcast component. And it's receiving a property called feeds, which is all by podcast feeds. Now, the way I would do that is I would create another function in the same file, and it has to have the name get server side props. And when you do that, what it does is it gives you server rendering. It runs this on the server side, and it then lets you return the data that you are about to run through the podcast component down below. Shape of it's a little strange. Um, it has a props key and some other keys as well, which we won't get into right now for sake of time. But the props key is one of them. Uh, and then the props key is every prop you want to feed to the component when you render it on the server before shipping it to the client. Now, let me mention that in this demo, um, I am using async await and just a quick 30 second async await. You mark a function async because you want to be able to handle promises within it. Uh, and it returns the result of a promise. Uh, you can use the await keyword and should whenever you do a promise instead of using dot then. And it will basically look like it's waiting on that line. It really does a promise behind the scenes. And it will only go to the next line after that data comes back. Now I don't show error handling in here, but quick answer for that. If you try catch around the await call, your catch will be the error of the promise. So you can handle errors as well. So get server side props is a named function you export from Next.js in order to get the data for the component when you route to it. So every time you route, it'll run get server side props. Um, it will let you then fill in the props. Uh, and then it will render your, your function uh, for your component, take that HTML content, ship it back down to the client as content and boot your React app. If you've already booted a React app, when you route to another page, it just ships the content down and replaces the view where the router is with that content, but you already have React booted, so everything is working from that point forward. Now, what about dealing with a path, right? So the example we had before, we were clicking on a, a particular podcast. So the link we had, which you probably can't see very easily there, uh, was localhost 3003 podcast, and then a slug for the podcast that we used. So that's my parameter. So how do we get this parameter out of the request? Well, it turns out you can give it a context. And the context has things like uh, params, which are the parameters that you define. Now, when you create a component in the in the it's called pages by the way I, I said routes it's pages uh, when you create a component for routing in the pages directory and you give it a bracketed name for the file name it will place the parameter in that path so slash podcast slash slug name in a variable called slug in this example in the context variables property called params so all you do is you inject context or you can destructure it and say curly braces params if you want, but we'll get our context, we'll grab the params out of the content uh, context, we'll grab slug out of that, and we do our call as we did before. And now we return back our data. Uh, in this case, my data that I returned from this API is a, a two properties, feed details and episodes, uh, because I need the feed details to show the icon for this terribly put together demo, and I need the episode details uh, for the actual item 
uh, podcast uh, show to show the show notes and the play button and the publication date, which also is terribly random. Sorry for my demo, uh, but at least as working code, you can use it. Uh, all right, so then same deal. You have your server side props, gets context, you get your params out of context, you do your query based on the param you want or params you want. And then it sends the data that it got to the component. You can then get those props out and you can do the work you're going to do. And beyond that, now I'm just kind of doing the beginning of my component here. This is a regular React component dealing with this data. Remix does it a little bit differently. So instead of, let's look at this again, instead of you exporting a function called get server side props, you export a function called loader. Now, they use hooks here. So uh, their hooks are based on a feature you're going to use. Generally, they expose a hook in React for that feature. So in your file for podcast and remix, so this would be the slash, uh, I think it's called routes actually. I mean, look, I'll double check for you. Here's the remix app, app routes. So we have podcasts, podcast, podcast, there it is. So didn't want to get it wrong. Um, so in this one, that podcast.typescript file, or you could use JS, um, is going to export a default function for the component, just like we saw before. But instead of the component getting props into it, so instead of using props like we saw in Remix, uh, in uh, Next, so see Next uses props. In Remix, we use a function, and then we use a hook to get the data from that function. So at the top of my file, I have an export const loader. This is an async function that does my get feeds. Basically, beyond that, it's the same as the other one. Except that what we return is purely the data we want. There's no extra properties to add. So whatever things we return from this, we then access using use loader data in our component, and it returns whatever was returned from the loader. And then from there, it's the same. Plain so old React at that point. Still server rendered, but the difference is Remix uses a hook, whereas React uses props to feed the data into the component. All right, Remix also for path, they also give you a context object. And one of the props there I'm destructuring is called params. And same deal. So in Remix, if I hit a route like slash route slash podcast slash blah, uh, that file, I should say. Now look at the difference in the file name. This is just different enough to drive you a little crazy when you're comparing the two. They were using brackets around the name of the of the of the uh, thing you're the param you're using. Instead, in Remix, you use dollar sign and the name of the file. Um, weird, different. They all have to be different from each other. Um, and so this says, go look for a variable called slug in params. Uh, again, loader is given a context that has a params prop. You grab the slug out of it. And now you've got your key for loading the podcast. Use loader data gets that back. And now I've got my feed details and episodes from the loader. I kind of made this long form. You could certainly make this shorter and more elegant, but I like being a little more explicit in my examples where I can. Uh, and then you're off and running. So again, it's not a magic bullet. Um, you know, you could be shifting your distributed performance problem into a shared services bottleneck. Again, you need to work with your uh, production team and with your site reliability team on properly scaling the services that you run this on. You could theoretically run this on a serverless platform. I'd be careful about the latency of starting up serverless methods. Um, you know, so I know there's an example of this out there where they're using serverless uh, uh, functions and lambdas on on um, uh, on AWS. Just be careful that you realize that there's warm up time for AWS for these things. Um, so server render, you might add back latency if you're not careful. Um, you can run this on Docker containers, you, which would be nice and fast as long as you have enough of them warmed up and you handle enough requests from those Docker containers. Um, in in Next.js, they use Vercel, which is the hosting company they are, they are run by. Since they're funded by a hosting company, they really have a good optimization for Vercel. Or you could run Node.js with the uh, Next.js engine running standalone and put it wherever you want it to be. But remember, you've got to deal with that site reliability and performance. 
Um, again, you can use Node.js database APIs or whatever APIs that you need to, to get to your server resources. Just remember, if they're going to take time, make sure you use something other than just doing server-side rendering uh, because you're going to hold up on that. Maybe you want a client render something that takes longer. So you get the main data that you want and then some status you need to fetch. You could hit fetch for that on the client side. Um, if it's a shorter piece of information, you don't need to render the initial page. All right, and obviously monitor your server metrics and scale them for load. Now let's look at static site generation. Again, this is only with Next.js. So this pre-renders content at build time. Um, again, it's statically rendered content and you ship that content up with the build, um, which means if you've got a lot of content, it could take a while. But if it's not a huge amount of content, uh, it, your builds won't be necessarily that big affected. Um, now, the rendered page downloads are really, really quick, as long as you've got good, uh, you know, slow, uh, low latency between you and the server, but you don't have to go anywhere else because it's statically rendered. So React bootstraps that asynchronously. Now, when you're running this in development mode, what it's going to do is it's going to do this server rendered because it, it can't do a generated build during development. So. If I play with the static site generated one, I just have to find which one it is, I'm sorry. It's this one, no, doesn't matter. SSG, there we go. Now we're in the statically generated one, theoretically. So you'd think we're running static generated, but because we're running in development mode, this has exactly the same look. Oh, I missed something, that's right, we'll talk about it. This has exactly the same look as it did before with server rendered Next.js. Doesn't look any different. Exactly the same profile. And that's because we're server rendering it. But I'm gonna break that and we're gonna do a full build here. So let me kill my demo environment. And now I'm gonna do a build. So now what's happening here is we're going to do a build using um, Re, uh, using Next.js's build process. And I have some debugging output in there because I was fixing a bug earlier. But now look down below here, it says generating static pages. Now it turns out if you take 40 or 50 podcasts and you take all the shows, you have a lot of content. And so what I'm doing is I'm rendering pages for each of the shows as part of my code demo. And you'll see here when it's done, it brings back a, a set of statistics on everything it built. Uh, and let's do this. Yeah. So this is basically saying that for each one of these things, it tells you what size it was uh, and the first load JavaScript, how long it took for each one. And now it's hitting all the different links. And in the demo I'm gonna give you, which I'll, I'll put in the comments and we'll also send you an email about, uh, it's a GitHub repo. You'll have all the examples. So you can play with this on your own, including a live database that you can hack with. Um, all right, there we go. So see all these pieces of content? So now that was the next build command. And then I did next uh, serve. And next serve runs the actual uh, static engine. So now that's our statically generated page. It looked almost instant. 20 milliseconds, nice and fast. I go to another one. That didn't even register. I mean, it was so small. Let's go back to podcasts. Yeah, look at that. That was for the, that was to get to the actual um, podcast I clicked on. And that was to get back. I believe, or maybe that was to get back. Oh, well, I can never find it. Hold on, uh, clear this, show details. We already loaded this, so it's cached. Of course, that makes sense to the browser. Back to podcasts, let's load things back. So it can be very quick. Now it's quick here because we've cached everything. Um, but suffice it to say, all the content is pretty much 
rendered immediately. If I clear cache and load this, let's take a look at the content. There it is again, fully rendered. So nice and quick. Now, where does it store this stuff? Well, it turns out if I go into the um, services, let's see, packages. Oh, it is here. There's a dot next JS or dot next uh, tree dot next cache. It's all sitting here in this tree thing. So all of these are sitting ready to ship, optimized images and everything ready to go, and web packed content. And this gets deployed to your server. All right, so the code for this. So there's two other functions that you'll use. One of them is called get static props in Next.js. Now remember, Next.js does things by passing in properties, props to your component and you give it a function to load the props. So this one runs at build time. If you have a get static props in a component, it will run it at build time. And then it will feed that data to the component at build time to generate the static version of that page. Same shape for the data props and then the names of the props and their values. This is just basically saying there's a key name feeds with the value of feeds that comes from the data. So same semantics, just using get static props instead. Now using server side generate instead of server side rendering. For parameters, we get the context in there as well, and we can grab the. Um, oh, I goofed up. Hold on. I should have shown you uh, the context, and I have it in the code. So let's just look at the code. All right, podcast slug. Here it is. Oh, wrong one. Xjs. There you go. So here's my static get static paths. All right, get the context, get the slugs. Oh, and I see what I did wrong here. Nope, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong function. I apologize, everybody. It's been a long morning for me here. We have a kid with COVID and everything's a mess in my house right now. So, all right, so get static props. I was looking at the static paths, which I'm gonna talk about next. Get static props, okay. Um, that one, I can grab the param slug and I can get the feed and episodes by slug. Same as before, basically get static props. But to feed the props for the service I generated, I use get static paths. And what this needs to know is what are all of the links that I'm generating? What are all the potential pages I'm generating? So for every path I might render, for every podcast that I might hit, I wanna generate, pre-generate the podcast page. So to do that, I need to tell the build tool the universe of pages I have to hit. So the first thing it hits is get static paths. I didn't need that in the other one because I was doing a, a main page and there was no parameter feeding the list of podcasts. But when I go to a podcast, that route has a parameter. So I need to tell it which pages to render and that's what get static paths job is. It again gets a content. You return a slightly different shape. So what we have here is a get podcast slugs function and the get podcast slugs function brings back all of the different uh, names of the podcast and slug form for a browser. It's like dashed instead of, you know, HTTP colons. Um, I then do a mapping of that and the paths key is what I give it. And the paths key is a, a collection of params, just like we saw with server side rendered for the params for each of the paths that I'm doing. So that gets sent and then there's other properties. So for example, whether I show a 404 page if I don't find it or maybe I handle that myself, um, what do I do about caching, so on. But for now, I need the universe of all the pages I might hit. So that's what this function's job is, if you just want to kind of think of it that way. And then for each one of the things it brings back, each of the sets of params it brings back, it runs the component, but it first runs it through get static props to get the props for that page. And then it renders that particular component to a file. 
Then it goes to the next static path it has, runs get static props for that one, and it renders it to a file, and so on and so forth. Again, I have working examples of all this, so you can take a look at it yourself, uh, and I will be giving you that. All right, so that's basically what these are. So get static props after get static paths. And again, the main difference is we get the paths from get static props, but the get static props got the, its context from the static paths. So tips here, don't do this against a billion rows of data. Your build will never finish. And your site reliability engineers and your, and your uh, people dealing with your uh, you know, product changes and things like that will go crazy. Um, so there, the get static paths, one of the things you can do is you can only return a subset, if you like, of the universe of paths with get static paths, and it will pre-generate those. The thing about service I generated is if you hit it and it doesn't recognize a key as something it's already generated, it'll go ahead and do service side rendering to load it up. And then it will cache it from that point forward until you shut down. So the fallback of server side rendering, which is still pretty good, um, and you don't have to server side generate everything. Just remember, don't forget to do a step to make sure you're not turning in too many of these and taking too long for your builds. That's the single biggest complaint that you'll probably run into. You can also use Next.js incremental static regeneration feature. And what this does is it lets you set a timeout interval. So assuming that your pages stay stale or, or are stale after a couple of days, maybe you set your timeout to you know a couple of days in, in, I think it's in seconds, but like how long that you want it to expire. And what'll happen is it will automatically expire that and use server-side rendering and cache that content so the content's up to date after a period of time. Now you might frown at that because you might think, well, how do I know? What if I have to make something invalidated automatically or if I wanna trip something that invalidates a page? Next.js has that feature available too. If you look at their incremental static regeneration or site, uh, static regeneration page in the docs, there are special functions you can add that let you tell the server to revalidate a page for you based on some conditions based on some build tool triggering something and saying, hey, content's changed, you've got to kind of invalidate this. So they really have thought through this. It's been around for a long time. So hence, they really, uh, they really err on the side of giving you a lot of features. Also, you can use this static site generation to provide SEO crawlable content. So that's nice because now you can get the content for your search engine, which may not need to be super up to date. Um, and then you can automatically on the client side use fetch or SWR, which is a smart fetch library that, that Next gives you to bring back fresh data after it loads. So it'll show something when it loads, but then it can flash and replace with better content. That's an option as well. Again, don't use this on super time sensitive data. Um, and also you cannot use it on data that needs user details. Keep that in mind. This is purely for data that does not need request level information because it's pre-generated. Um, if you're gonna do something like that, then you need to have some React components within it that fetch things dynamically. Uh, and that's when you really wanna start thinking about server-side rendering, perhaps. So because of all these issues and because of other issues with static site generation, um, the Remix team says, you know what? You could really get um, server-side uh, rendering to be just as fast or even faster in some cases than loading a whole bunch of statically generated content. They spent a lot of time looking at um, the um, Next.js code against theirs, and there's a, a really interesting article out there uh, that's, that uh, is basically, um, uh, I can't remember, Ryan Florence is his name. Ryan Florence, from the, who's the creator of Remix, one of the two creators, has a really good paper uh, that he says is, is a um, unbiased uh, review of both. I'm not going to put any uh, concerns around that. He's trying to do his best to try to figure out which one runs faster. So if keep the unbiased part in your mind that it's it's a member of the Remix team. That's not necessarily meaning it's not unbiased, but it is their team. But one thing they said was, if you've got things like, um, you know, a, a, a waterfall of things that have to hit in sequence, because you've got routes that have like component to component to component to component, and each of those has different things that load, 
if they're not being done in parallel, and if you didn't write your code in parallel, uh, you're going to have terrible performance. And with static site generation, the way they do the static site generation, they load all the data back and they do a network fetch to make sure it's up to date. And all that stuff can actually slow things down in certain types of situations slightly. Regardless, in either technique, they're probably both faster than doing it on the on the client side. Um, but there's something you want to read into and you can look at their feed to get a feel for what this is about. The other thing Remix Run did is keep in mind, they are the creators of the uh, React Router API and the React Router API, um, they keep enhancing it. And so what Remix Run does is they let you define routes in this file structure. So you've got a customer's under, under your, your routes, you've got a customer's uh, customer ID directory and orders and an order ID.tsx or something. You can have it such that you, def you define the customer ID uh, page to have a router outlet in it where it would render any nested route. So it would render the order ID component. And the cool thing about this is both can do server side rendering at exactly the same time, pulling pieces of the request uh, parameters. So if you hit this customer's customer ID orders order ID.tsx, uh, and you hit that in the browser, it will load up both components server side, render both components server side, ship them down, and it will do them in parallel. Um, they also say you should be doing things like putting things co-located. So if you can, let's say it's a content-based database, if you can replicate that data into the edge or into a place co-located close to the edge of your, of your services, and then use a database call to hit it, you're probably faster or as fast as servers generated anyway, anyway, and your code is simpler overall. The other cool thing about this is each of these components can have their own loading states. So you can have like a I'm still loading a piece of content to show without whether it's a spinner or fetching data in different parts of the page at the same time. And as they come up, they'll render themselves and get ready and, and get started. They can also all have their own error boundaries. So you can have error handling within each of those components, even though you hit the full route, the orders one might fail, fine. You can show the error for that one. The customer one might fail, fine. You can show the error for that one, but you still have the outlet for the order. So you have a lot of options here for what you can do. And I included a link here for the nested rounding discussion in Remix Run to give you a feel for how that works. All right, the last thing I wanted to talk about from the Remix versus Next side of things is client-side rendering. Um, so remember, both of these tools give you a fetch API for the server, for server-side rendering, for static site generation in Next.js. Client-side rendering gives you an, an additional API that lets you handle automatic refreshing and staleness and reloading things when clients go off and online. And it's an API called SWR. Uh, it stands for stale wall revalidate. It's part of the uh, HTTP spec. Um, and so what they do is they give you an API you tell it the fetching API to use by configuring it, which I'm using fetch in my example, and it will automatically fetch and then refresh code in the React client once the client is loaded. So this is basically a smart loading and caching and invalidation tool that can kind of serve in the place of your regular fetch API. So you can have it automatically reload based on whether your page goes invisible or not, like if you get overlaid by another thing and bring it back, you can automatically reload it on the client side once the page has been loaded and visible. Also, you can say maybe every 30 seconds automatically reload this for like a dashboard where you wanna keep everything up to date. Um, you can tell it to do it when the network goes offline and online. Um, and this is configured through a high order component called SWR config and any of the SWR component uh, API calls within a component inside of that can take the configuration that you set. So you can set this all the way at the top of the application and have one global configuration. And then for very specific fetches, you can have more specific timeouts and refreshes. All right, so this comes from RFC 5861 from the HTTP uh, spec. Uh, that's where SWR comes from. So the idea is you get a stale response from let's say um, static site generation and then you can automatically use SWR on top of it to refresh it and make the latest one. So you hide latency and give them interactivity as long as they can tolerate a, a flicker of older data just to get started. It depends whether on, on your part, whether that makes sense or not to do. So back to our demos here, if I do SWR, oh, hold on. <laughs> 
I knew I would do this to myself. I have to restart everything. And this is because I started in build mode instead of starting in, uh, instead of running my existing stuff. Okay, so my development mode. All right, SWR. Here we are again. So SWR, um, actually wrong page, using SWR. So this is, this is Next.js, the component comes down, but the component is using the SWR API. Now this looks a lot like the other ones, doesn't it? It looks more like the React one. So you see we boot everything up and then we fetch our content so you find it on here. Stand by for an awkward pause. All right, well, trust me that it's there. It's in here somewhere. Um, so SWR is interesting, but watch what happens when I leave the page and I come back. Do you see it flicker there? Let me highlight the page to prove that it's reloading. It reloaded that component. Did it reload all of the page? No. So this component is using SWR to fetch the content. This this one with, the, with all the cards in it. So when I leave the page, it will reload itself. And that's because I've configured SWR to refresh on visibility. I'll show you how we did this. SWR podcasts. All right, so here's the code. Oh yeah, I wanted to show you the static. This isn't really being used much um, because it's so quick it doesn't even see it, but I'm using SSR for skeletons on the server side, fake, fake content on the server side, like blocks, but it's so fast it doesn't even show them. Um, but when we load our page, We use the use SWR function. I'm going to break this line here just so you can see the call. So instead of using fetch and instead of using use effect, note that we're not using use effect here, um, use SWR is like a use effect for data. Uh, it loads data asynchronously and it keeps it up to date. Um, and so you get your request and then it asks for a fetcher. Uh, quick answer for what a fetcher is, is it's just a wrapper around your fetching tools. So this is in the documentation. I won't spend time on this, but basically you wrap your fetching API with error handling and that's a fetcher. So you fetch your code or fetch your data uh, and then it returns back four things. This is kind of cool. It returns back the payload when it's there. If it fails, it returns back the error. If it's currently running, it returns up true for is validating. And if you want to mutate it by reloading it manually, it returns a function for you to call to do that. That would cause a reload of the data. So beyond that, this is just a regular client side React component um, doing its work. Um, but the data comes in from here. So now I can say, oh, was there an error? Then I'll return some error. Is it validating? I'll return some spinner. And otherwise, I return my data. So again, the other thing I did here is I showed building a skeleton. They're called skeletons. Have you ever seen like a page, like you go to uh, Facebook or something and you see like before your feed show up, you got little blocks that kind of look the shape of wh where things are. And they're the exact same shape as the content so that the content is, doesn't have to reflow. Well, those are called skeletons. Thank you, Drew Karn, for telling me that. Uh, and skeletons, when you return them, um, they will render first while SWR gets up and running. Again, mine's so fast you don't even see it. But uh, mine have the same shape as when I'm rendering. So I'm using get static props from SSR for server side rendering to do that. And then I'm using SWR to give the less stale version of that. Also think of it this way. For SEO, you could have it return SEO friendly data here and immediately use SWR to overlay it with real data if you have a critical page that needs SEO. Oh, and by the way, if we uh, do something where um, I'm not sure. Oh, if I'm changing, I think I put paging on here. Did I not? Yes, I did. So when I switch the paging, I have a demo using paging in here. 
I request different batch sizes using SWR. And that's what I have in here. So whenever I change that drop down, I trigger handle result size change. I get the value from the drop down and I call mutate from SWR. And mutate will automatically, sorry, I'm gonna scroll down to this mutate. Why can't I find anything when I need it? Here it is. So I call mutate in the function when it happens. So that's why I put mutating there is to show you paging. I have one more thing to show you, and I'm sorry for taking all this time, but there's a really, really neat feature of, of Next.js um, called image optimization. Uh, and let's see if I get it to play right. And now, of course, it's not playing. <laughs> of course, it's not going to work. Oh, me. Oh, well. I know it works on server side. Um, what it's supposed to do and what the demo should do, oh, it is doing it. Um, I know why it's doing it the way it's doing it. It's doing it because it's loading the first uh, scrollable view and it's loading some of the images up early. So there's an image tag and I'll show it to you my components here. So my components, my image card component uses this. You'll notice that I import image from next image. And if I flipped on the flag that properly optimizes images, instead of using an IMG, I use the image tag. The great thing about the image tag is that when you are scrolling down, take a look at the request down below here, and you start hitting more images, these are really faint, but it's actually loading the images as they come into view. And it can optimize their size, and it can be run on the server side to generate nice optimized images like WebP images. So that's the image tag. If you use the capital I image tag from Next.js, then it will scatter load your images as it needs to. Oh, and I'll show you the higher order component here. Uh, the higher order component for my app is here. So this is my SWR config. So I say refresh if it's hidden, refresh when I go offline, which I will not demo or I will no longer have a presentation. Um, and I can say every 400,000 milliseconds refresh it automatically. And then I embed my application. So that's the higher order component for the stale wall revalidate component if you take advantage of that. All right, so we're comparing the frameworks. Uh, Next.js has server side rendering, so does Remix Run. Only Next.js has static site generation. They recommend that you use a infrastructure cache. So it's interesting. They say, you know, you probably already have uh, cloud servers that do caching or services you can use, use them. So they shifted onto the site reliability engineers and the performance management engineers. Valid, um, and maybe that's uh, something you could look into. They both have page-based routing. Uh, the nested routing remix run is, is I think, superior. Uh, Client-side smart fetch library, you could use it in either one, I believe, but it's from Next.js. Um, it is a separate project on GitHub, so you should be able to use it even from a Remix app if you have the need, need to do that. Uh, streaming results, uh, they both can stream content. I've not dug into that much, but they both claim they can stream content and stream responses for uh, things that are loading on the fly. The image optimization is the image component. It is part of the next project. You can't really use it in Remix, so you'd have to look for a third-party component to do that for Remix. Uh, and script loading, they also have a really cool script tag, capital S, that you can say, um, maybe I don't want my analytics from Google to take up time on my initial render. Maybe I want to do that right afterwards. So you tell it basically to load that once the app settles enough that it's doing things asynchronously. Another cool thing, and there's a bunch of those out there for Next.js. Um, also coming down the pike is React server components. I really tried to get these working for a demo. Um, I just ran out of time for this in ETE and they're still kind of early. Uh, the Remix team doesn't feel that they're that useful uh, in terms of like what they do versus uh, server-side React. Um, the, if you want to experiment with server-side React, you can definitely do it with Next.js. They have support for it. Um, and they also have support for the suspense component, which is, giving you content that you embed within suspense until the content comes back that you want. Um, and again, the remix team will tell you that this is not an efficient way to do things. I would say give it a couple months, 
until more and more platform support suspense and React 18 stream, uh, components before you really make a final determination of whether the, the Remix team is right on that. Maybe they'll come out with their feature of, of suspense, who knows. But there's an example of using suspense. If you take a look at a, a thing that's being rendered, uh, you'll see suspense. Fallback is note skeleton. Um, and then when you get your note back, um, you can generate the note itself. Their demo doesn't run. I couldn't get it to run. But that's the URL at the bottom for this exact demo that you can take a look at um, from the Remix run. I'm sorry, from the Next.js samples. All right, so Next.js and Remix run. They extend React to the server side to decrease latency. They give you a great backend for your front end server solution for SPAs. They help you break up your monolithic React applications into page based routes. Um, they support deployment to edge servers. Static generation of content for Next.js and server-side rendering for both. Here's the last warning I'm going to give you before we end and look at questions. Um, I think the biggest concern here is these are specific solutions. If you decide to use one of them, you're locking into that vendor right now. There's no standard for these things. So if you lock into that vendor, that means you're probably not going to be able to easily move away from them without rewriting a lot of your uh, pages. So consider that. Um, you know, consider the hosting fees for the services you're looking at, consider the target platforms that you're looking at, do they support these server rendering techniques, uh, consider where your data is located, whether it makes sense to do this. Um, but these are tools in your toolbox as a React developer to hopefully speed up your applications. All right, um, I will send another email out. Uh, this is the one from ETE. I'd like to give you a later update. So. Uh, for now, um, just wait for the email for the actual link, but let's go through questions now. Okay, so Matt Brophy says, worth noting all the parallel data loading capabilities coming over to React Router for SPA apps. Yes, that's cool too. Um, so because the Remix team is enhancing React Router, um, they're giving you that feature as well, but they basically used it in re re um, Remix run early. All right, and yes, I could have simulated offline. I'm sorry. Um, Ryan also uh, says, uh, or, I'm sorry, Matt Burfield says, Ryan's Reactathon talk last week shows what, if your remix, I'm oh, sorry, uh, shows the upcoming remix version for Suspense HP streaming. Excellent. So it's been three weeks and he already has an updated demo. Let's see how quickly this stuff moves. Probably a good idea to say wait for this stuff. So that's great. I'm glad you caught that and I appreciate that, Matt. That's good to know that they're actually going to be doing that. Um, instead of the, the paper that they had out there, they must have updated their thinking. Any other questions? Oh, in Next, can you have slug and ID in the same folder? No, I don't believe you can have um, two different paths in the same names, variable names in the same folder because they're going to be substituting for that path location. So you would probably have like podcast slash slug slash slug TSX and podcast slash ID slash ID TSX in different subfolders of podcast, if that makes sense. You'd run into the same thing with Remix. Any other questions? All right, well, listen, thank you very much for attending the talk. It'll be available online uh, and we will get you links to the presentation and updated GitHub repository with some samples in it. And I thank you for your time today. Thank you very much.